going to break some things. And so, God, we thank you for your word. We ask that you speak to our hearts, oh God. Let us hide in our hearts that we may not sin against thee. We love you. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You amen. can be seated. Amen. On tonight, um, again, we're continuing on uh, with our series, our Brokenness series. This is our third installment. Um, and on tonight, we're going to be coming from Psalm 51 and 17, a very familiar passage of scripture to many of us, praise God. And so I will just read this scripture in your hearing. And the word of God reads, it says that the sacrifices of God are a broken, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. And so we thank and we praise God on tonight. Again, we're talking about brokenness. And we know that God wants us to have a broken and a contrite heart. Praise God. We realize that God wants us to be repentant. In other words, we want to fall upon the stone because we do know, of course, we were talking about that. We have to fall upon the stone and break ourselves. If not, he'll fall upon us and he'll grind us to powder. Um, of course, as we fall upon the Lord and we break ourselves, that means that's considered as humility. And so God wants us, of course, to humble ourselves because realizing we can never please God with our outward actions. A lot of us, we try to please God by doing things. And God wants us to do things. And don't get me wrong. God wants us to do good things. He wants us to do great things. He wants us to do godly things. He wants us to bless people and bless him. However, a lot of times we feel like just our, our actions alone or how good we are, how good we act, that that's just, that's just enough. But God wants us to take every area of our lives and he wants us to present it before him because the Bible tells us that we have to present our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy and acceptable, which is our reasonable service. And so we are called to be of service to God. We're called to be of absolute surrender to God. We're called to yield ourselves and give ourselves completely to him. Because ultimately, he gets the glory. Am I right about that? And so he cannot just get glory just by our actions alone. There's a lot of good people, but God wants us to be godly. And that's what a little g, G-O-D-L-Y, that's an everything all-encompassing who we are. In other words, we need to reflect the mirror image of Christ. We need to be able to show him. So when people are seeing us and they're seeing our actions, they're not really seeing him in his fullness. And God wants to be seen in his totality in us. And that's a growth process. And so brokenness is one of those processes we don't talk about in church and many of us don't like to talk about because it means we have to completely yield ourselves and actually surrender ourselves to God. And he's the one that created us. He knows everything about us. He knows everything he desires to have done through us, in us, by us, and for us. And so if we don't give ourselves completely up to him, Instead of worrying about what we're able to do, we know he's able to do all things but fail. But the Bible says to us that all things are possible with God. And there's nothing that's impossible. All we've got to do is have the faith to believe. And so our actions alone is just not good enough. So it doesn't matter how good we are for our actions, but it matters if our heart is right with God. Because at the end of the day, God is not only hearing what's coming out of our mouth, but he hears what's coming in our, out of our hearts. And the Bible tells us not only does he hear just what's coming out of our mouth, but he also hears our heart. So a lot of people can say a lot of things with their mouth. They can tell you they love you, but in their heart they despise you. Those are contradictories. So God is ultimately looking and trying the heart of every man. So he not only hears and sees our outward deeds, but he's also looking at what's going on on the inside. And what matters is really what goes on on the inside. We talked briefly um, on our first um, installment about the triunity of man. And we talked about the fact that we have an... Uh, let me Here it is. Can you, give, can you, sir? Amen. Thank you, sir. Just to kind of, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be going a little fast, but I do want to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what we're talking about on tonight so we can really understand who we are and what God is really trying to do. 
When we talk about the triunity of man, and I'm backtracking here real quick just to give just to over a general synopsis. Just imagine three circles built inside of one another. This right here, this is our body. And inside of our body, we have a soul. Now our soul is made up of our mind, our emotions, and our will. And at any time, our soul can either be in control or our soul can get out of control. And I'm a teacher, as y'all can see, so I like to illustrate things where we can see it. It makes it a lot easier for us to understand. So, and then, of course, we have our spirit. Now, we are all speaking spirits. Why? Because when God first created man, he blew what? He blew his spirit in us, and we became a living soul. So that's the reason why we are speaking spirits. And so what happens is that, just like a child in Walmart, you see them falling out having their tempted tantrums, they just be cutting up, mama telling them stop, don't touch, they smacking stuff around, and they doing what they want to do and not being obedient. Well, that's what happens with the soul. Because our mind, we made up in our mind, we're going to do it what we want to do. It's my thing. Or you heard that song say, it's your thing. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to sock it to. Y'all remember that song, us that are older. Well, the mind wants to do what it wants to do. So the mind decides that it does not want to obey. And so emotionally, we just are all out of control. We're not listening to what mama is telling us to do or daddy is listening to what God is telling us to do. So we become out of control. Why? Because we're doing what we will. Not his will, but we're doing our will. And so our will, our mind, our emotions, and our will is out of control. Therefore, our soul is out of control. Anytime we don't obey God, every, if we don't do what he tells us to do according to his word, then guess what? Our soul is out of control. But when we're obedient to the word of God, when we say, God, I'm going to let this mind be in me that's also in Christ Jesus. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to get into my feelings. I'm not going to get into my flesh. Because remember, I told you all, flesh, if you cancel the H, spell it backwards, that's self. And self is in flesh. When we sin, when we sin individually, it's not anybody else around us that sin. I sin. So it's all about me. When I do something and I'm not doing what will the will of God, when I'm out of control in any area of my life, regardless of what it is that I'm doing, then that means that my mind, my emotions, and my will, my soul is out of control. It's not aligning itself with the Spirit of God. And so what happens is that the Holy Spirit has to go through, and I'm going to just put H-S, the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, however many of us want to say, it has to go through our body to mm -hmm. get through our soul. That's right, because the Spirit is in the middle. Amen. And the Spirit, excuse me, sir, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Well, I'm with I'm you. Fence. And the Spirit is in the middle. The pastor mm -hmm. is exactly right. And the Spirit is in the middle. So we've got the body, the soul, and then the inner circle is the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God, it's got to go through our body to get through our soul, our mind, our emotions, and our will to get to the very Spirit that he bred in us in the very beginning. it got to go through a whole lot of stuff. It's got to go through our flesh to get to who we really are. And this, the spirit, this right here, this is the real us. This is who we really, this is who God really made us. But all of this stuff here has to be is, broken. It has to be broken. This is the enemy of the enemy working in us. And so we have to be ever so careful. Um, so as to make sure that we reconcile within our minds either 
Am I going to stop sinning? Willfully stop sinning? Am I going to genuinely stop sinning? Am I going to get out of the sin business? Um, am I really sorry for my sins? And am I not going to do it again? Because we first got to be sorry. So that's a part of contrition. That's to be contrite. And then, of course, um, God wants us to repent. So on tonight, we're talking about the fact that God wants us to have a broken spirit. He wants to have a broken and contrite heart. He said, and this he will not despise. So what in other words, God is saying, if you humble yourself, if you fall on me, then what I'm going to do, I'm going to be pleased with that. Because you're not going to force me. You're not going to force my hand. You're not going to force the wrath of God to come upon you because of disobedience. Because God will chastise us. And he chastises us, why? Because he loves us. So just like we chastise our kids, we chastise them because we love them. We want them to do the right thing. We want them to get in line. Well, God will do the same thing for us. So we don't want God to, to chastise us, but he will if he has to. Praise God. And so on tonight, we're talking about broken things. And so my question to you is, have you ever broken anything? Have any of you ever broken any dishes? Have you ever broken somebody's heart? Have you had some broken or some shattered dreams? Because we've all experienced these things. And sometimes, like with dishes, when they're broken, they're of no use anymore to us. Am I right? So what do we do? We throw them away. We discard them, right? They, they're trash to us, right? But how many of you know that God, with, with, with us, we, we've broken God's heart, have we not? We, we, God has dreams and has had some things he desired for us to do. And, and along the way, we, we got out of line and we decided to go our way and not his way. And that broke God's heart. That broke, that broke train of what the direction that he was sending us. But God always, even with us going in a different direction, God has a way of bringing things back to where they need to be. And that's what's so good about God. So even though... Um, we may throw things away and we may render them useless. God didn't render us useless. So even when we broke his heart, even when we didn't do everything that we, he wanted us to do, he didn't just throw us away like we would have done the broken dishes. Or how when we've had those relationships or different things that happened, we, you know, it, it was over, it was over. But with God in us, it's not over. You know, it's not over. He continues to pursue us. Am I right? Because why? He loves us. Praise God. And so one of the things I love about God is that he finds broken things useful. So even when we were broken, even when we weren't doing what was right, he still found us useful. He didn't just throw us away. I want you to turn your attention to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 8. This is what the word of God says. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my ways than your thoughts. So in other words, we, we may have, God's thinking is not like our thinking. Our thinking is very limited, praise God. Um, the wisdom and the knowledge of God is far surpassing than anything we could ever think. He already has plans for us. And the Bible says they are good and not of evil, evil and are going to bring about an expected end. In other words, God is going to bring something good out of it. The Word of God says that all things work together together. For the good of them that love God and that are the called according to his purpose. We all have been called by God. We all have a call. And there's a purpose for each and every one of our lives, praise God. So it's foolish for us to think. A lot of times we try to fit God into our way of thinking. But our thinking is limited. So we're only going to be able to get so much out of the way we think. It's only going to go so far. But we just heard that the thinking 
And the thoughts of God are higher than the heavens is from the earth. So that's so far reaching. We couldn't even begin to touch the tip. It's certainly not the ceiling of the thinking of God. So God thinks so much highly. The plans that he has, Brandy, you just see right now. This is surface what you see. But if you continue to follow him, the things that God has in store for you will be far wider and greater than you could have ever imagined or thought. And that's what he's saying to each and every one of us on today. So it would be foolish for us to try to mold God into our thinking when we should be shaped and molded into him. Because he is a, he, his, the, he's an unlimited God. He's an unlimited God. And so I'm glad that the ways of God are much more better than men. Men are limited. They'll, we'll, we'll only go so far with people. But God, he'll go all the day. He'll go the distance. He'll go be above and beyond. So with us, we look down, for instance, when we see people that are broken. You see a broken down car on the side of the road. We see it as useless. Am I right? Well, we ride by because our car is running. But that car sitting on the side of the road. We like, man, whoever that car belongs to, if they don't come get it, they gonna come and take it and, and, and put it in, in the scrapyard somewhere. Or they gonna have to go and pay to get it out. And it's gonna cost them probably more than what it's worth to fix. We, we if there were any of us have been in those situations before, praise God. But God, he doesn't, whatever, if it's broken down, infirm, less than perfect, he don't care. Because guess what? He has everything that we need to put us back together again. Just like when Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horsemen and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. But God can put us back together. He can shape us, he can make us, and he can mold us again, and he can make us masterpieces. That's why broken things with God, though it doesn't matter, because he can make us again. He can make us over, and he can make us better than we were before. So whatever situations and circumstances we find ourselves in, even right now, this is temporary. God has a plan even now. And it's yet working for our good. So it does not matter what's going on with us. Say not so with God. Not so with God. We won't stay broken. We won't stay the way we are forever. Because this is not the way God designed and desired for us to be. He designed us and desires for us to be made whole. But body, soul, and spirit's got to come together. It's got to align itself with the perfect will of God. And then all those things that we desire from God and all of those things that God has set and desires for us, they'll come to fruition. It's just a matter of time. So Psalm 51 and 17 says that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and a contrite heart. And I'm here to tell you that God can save us. Praise God. And all we have to do is become broken. All we have to do is become broken. And one of the things the Bible tells us that it's his strength that is made perfect in our weakness. If we would become vulnerable before God, if we would show ourselves, there's nothing wrong with being weak. Sometimes we think weakness, we take weakness as, 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 as a, a, a downfall. We don't think that there's strength in it. But the Bible says that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. So if we would yield and submit, because that's what yielding and submitting is. It's becoming weak. It's becoming vulnerable. It's laying our lives down before God and saying, God, have your way in me. Because I cannot do it all by myself. But I know that you can do everything that I need. God, I know you've got it. 
And we've got to have the faith and to trust him to do it. Now, if we would turn our attention to Judges, chapter 6, verse 36, we'll start there. Um, if any of you all are familiar with Gideon, now Gideon, let's see here, let's see, Judges chapter 6, verse 36, let's go there. Judges 6, Judges, Judges I'm sorry. Judges, Judges chapter 6, yeah, yeah, okay. amen, Judges chapter 6, verse 36, because here God commissions Gideon to do a work, praise God. Here, but let's just, I'm not going to go all the way and read everything. But of course, we know that he was, he was going um, against the Midianites, basically. There was, there was a battle going on, and Gideon, he was the son of Joash, praise God, and he had gone, um, ultimately, uh, they were in battle, praise God. And so, what happened in this particular thing was that uh, Jerubbabel, he had um, gone before Baal pleading against, against him. And um, of course they went and they threw down the altar um, of God. And so here we go in, let's see, let me go ahead and just read it, verse 33. It says, and then all the Midianites and the Amalekites, you know, the, all those Izites, all those issues that we go through in our lives, and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched the valley of Jezreel. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. And Abiezer, 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 excuse me, was gathered after him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him and sent messengers unto Asher, and unto Zebulon, and unto Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. Now these are, of course, some of the tribes, um, of one, some of the 12 tribes. And then in verse 36, it says, And Gideon said unto God, If thou would save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor, and if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, and thou shalt hast said, as thou hast said. So in other words, what he was saying was, Lord, I got weak faith, but if you will show me a sign, and the sign was that if you would allow the fleece, he says here, to have dew on the fleece only. In other, word, in other words, let the fleece be a little damp. Let it be damp. But on the side, the bottom side that's on the earth, let it be dry. He said, then I'll know that you have given me your word and that you are going to allow me to conquer the enemy. Praise God. And so God did it. And so then we go to the next. He says, but behold, he said, now this is what he does, he says here in, and it, let me go here, okay, praise God. Verse 38, he says, and it was so, so God did that. He says, for he rose up early on the morrow and thrust the fleece together. And what he did is he wrung it out and there was a bowl full of water. So when he wrung it out, it was wet. And so he wrung all the water out. So God helped, he gave him his word, and he did it. It says, and then and Gideon said unto God, he said, now let not thine anger be hot against me, God. He said, but I will speak but this once. He said, let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. He said, let it now be dry only upon the fleece. On the top part, let it be dry. He said, but upon the ground, let it be wet. So in, a, under, in other words, under the bottom, now God, let it be wet. And so God did what he asked because he still, his faith was still, you know, still a little, he still questioning God. So his faith was still lacking. So, and God did what Gideon asked him. So that night, and for it was dry upon the fleece only, upon the top, this time it was dry. And there was dew on 
all the ground. In other words, under the bottom, it was wet. So God, this is the second time he goes. He puts his faith out there again. He says, God, I'm just still not really sure. But if you do it this time, God, then I know that you're going to allow me to conquer the Midianites. So God did it. And so what ultimately happens is that a third time he goes out and Gideon, he goes on to, to go on into war and he defeats the Midianites. But what God does, if you go into the seventh chapter um, in your time, if you can read it, and I'm going to just give you an over synopsis of here, on to the 22nd verse. So Judges 6, 36 through Judges 7 through 22, if you can write that down, read that in your personal time. What God did is that he didn't want Gideon to get the glory. Um, Gideon started out with 32,000 men. Let me go and read that in your hearing. Okay, let's see here. Because I like to read the word. I don't like to just... Okay, let's go ahead and read here. It says, Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the Mount of Gilead. And there returned the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. So in other words, he started out with thirty-two thousand. If you read, Gideon started out with thirty-two thousand soldiers. And so what happened was that God told him, He said, Okay, I'm gonna send you out. And he gave him some specific instructions to tell them. He told them, In my hand, God is gonna allow me to beat the Midianites. And he told them, he said, but Speak this into the people's ear. Now, those that were fearful, he said, they're not going to go with you. But those that are not fearful, they're going to go with you. So what happened was that 22,000 of them, they returned. And 10,000 stayed. And so then, of course, God being who he is, because sometimes God has to... Have you ever had, a, a, when you've been going out and you've been doing something and you have a lot of people that are with you, and so it's kind of easy to believe when you got more people on your side, and then, God, some people fall off, and you kind of get a little discouraged, like, oh, man, some of my people that fell off, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. Well, what God wants to do with us sometimes, he'll reduce our army. And that's what he did. He reduced Gideon's army. And so it goes on to say, and the Lord said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. He said, you still got too many people. Because God did not want Gideon to get the glory. And God does not want us to get the glory. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that he started breaking down Gideon's army. He started breaking down his army. Just like what he has to do with us sometimes. He has to break us down. Sometimes he has to break us down even from our family. It's a lot of us. You remember Abram, when he went out to go out to the far country, and he took Lot with him? Mm -hmm. And then he told him, he said, well, Lot went his way, and Abram went his way, because Lot thought he was getting the best of the land because he saw all oh, what was green. And then Abram took that which was not as fruitful, didn't have all the vegetation. But ultimately, it turned out to be the most fruitful land, and he had the blessing of God upon him. Well, this is the same thing that God is doing with Gideon. Because Gideon started out with 32,000. It's so much easier to believe that I got 30,000, 32,000 people going out with me to fight the Midianites, to fight my enemy. So surely I'm going to win now. But then God reduces your army, because I don't want you to get the glory, so I'm going to take you down a notch. And then what God ultimately does, if you read further on, he takes him down to 300 men. He goes from 32,000 to 300 men, if you read the rest of the passage of scripture here. And then what he does, his 300 goes against 135,000 Midianites. That's a lot of soldiers for 300 people. So this man of God has been reduced from 32,000 to 10,000 and now to 300. I guess 135 enemies. 
And that's how it is with God. And then let me read this to you all in your hearing. And not only, excuse me, does he do that, but look at God. Let me get here. So then Gideon, it says, and it was so when Gideon heard telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof, he worshiped and returned to the host of Israel and said, arise. And I want you all to read the scripture because I'm cutting through the chase. He says that he worshiped and returned into the host of Israel and said, arise, for the Lord had delivered into your hand. Now he's delivering into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. So now he's taking the 300 men. This is in verse 16 that he done reduced him down to. He done reduced it. I'm skipping down through the scriptures. He reduced him down to 300 men. He's now divided into 300 companies. That's 100 men per company. Amen. He says, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers. Now listen at what he's getting ready to do here. He's giving them a trumpet and he's giving them empty pitchers and lamps within the pitch and within the pitchers. And he said unto them, he said, look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that. As I do, so shall you do. When I blow with a trumpet, and I, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of the camp, and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now he's giving them explicit instructions. This is very important. When God gives you explicit instructions. You follow it to the T. It may sound foolish to some people. It may sound crazy to you. But you do exactly what God says exactly the way God says because this is a part of you being broken. Because you're showing that you are able to follow instructions. Clear and concise and precise instructions from the Lord. So he tells them to do this. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him, see Gideon, he had a hundred men were with him, came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And the Bible goes on to say, and they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets. And they did what God said. And break the pictures. I want y'all to underline these things because these are very important. That were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pictures and held the lamps in their left hands. Very explicit instructions. And the trumpets, come on somebody, in their right hands and blew with all. They all blew the trumpets that were in their right hands. And they cried. They said what? The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And then they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the hosts ran and cried and fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. Even throughout all the hosts, the host fled to Beth Shittah in Zerarath and the border of Abel Mahola uh, to Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, out of Asher, and out of all of Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites, and take before them the waters unto Beth Barah 
and Judah. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Judah. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gibeon on the other side of Jordan. So in other words, what happened here was the weapons that they had were just pictures with candles inside them. The word that God told them to speak and the light shines forth. When we obey God, God will give you victory and he'll allow you to slay your enemy. He'll allow you to slay your enemy. But we've got to become broken. We have to become obedient. We have to do what God says do. We have to say what God says say. He didn't say to say the God of anybody else. He said the God of Gideon. And then he said, he said the God of Z let me go back here. He said to say the God of, of Gideon. Amen. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon, of Gideon. That's all he told him to say. But the sword of the Lord and Gideon. So we have to say what God tells us to say. We have to use what God tells us to use. And then we have to do what God tells us to do. So when we have the ability, because y'all know the first level of our maturity is to be able to hear what God, hear from God, step out by faith and do what God tells us to do. That's our first level of maturity. So if we don't hear what God is saying do, Gideon heard what God said do. They had to hear what God told Gideon to do. And Gideon told them. And then they had to have faith that what Gideon said to do was the right thing to do. And then they had to do it. And then they were able to overcome their enemies. So a lot of times when we don't do what God says do, they went from 32,000 to 10,000 to 300. So he decreased them all the way down to 300. And they were able to defeat 135 million knights. And not only did he allow them to do that, but they were able to slay their enemies, the leaders, the head. So we can kill the enemy of our souls by being obedient and doing what God tells us to do. So the Midianites, they turned on one another. And they began to fight one another. Because Gideon didn't have to do nothing but say what he said. And then they, they began to fight one another. And that's what will happen when people come against the people of God. God will use them to fight themselves and defeat themselves. We don't have to always go and go fist to cuff with nobody. All we got to do is put the word of God on them. All we got to do is humble the gale and say what God says. Speak the word of God. Do what God says to. Follow in the order in which God has ordained for us. And then we'll see the enemy be defeated. Because they'll defeat themselves. They'll devour themselves. That's why you see a lot of times when people at work or somebody say something against you. And then you don't, you don't entertain it. You just go and pray. And you say, God, you know. You know the way that I take. God, you in control. And then what happens is that they be like, well, uh-uh, I didn't say that you said that. No, but they said that. No, but she told. And then they start bickering and fighting amongst themselves. Have y'all ever had that to happen? And then you just step right on out of the situation. And you just, and you just let them bicker and devour themselves. Well, that's what happened here. If you read this story, ultimately, the Midianites destroyed themselves. And so the God, the God that we serve, he will give us victory if we will be broken enough to follow and to do what he says to you and allow him to do what he does best. And that's to give us the victory. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3. Jeremiah verse, chapter 4, verse 3. This is what the word of God says. It's for, for thus said the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem. He says, break up 
your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Now, Pastor taught us, um, if you ever heard about the, the, the uh, story about the sower, um, it's in Luke, I believe, um, that that passage of scripture is in. And it talks about sowing among thorns. Ultimately, what happens is that the thorns will choke out because anytime thorns start to come up, you're breaking up the ground, right? You're tilling it up. You're making the ground soft. You're making it, preparing it in order to sow seeds. Farmers, praise God, when they go out to do the ground, anybody, anybody that look at it, if you've ever done farming or seen any farming, they go out there and they till up the ground. Because nothing can go in the ground and actually produce a harvest or fruit unless the ground is broken up and softened up. It's the same way with our hearts. Our hearts have to be softened up. So the follow ground that he's talking about is the ground of our hearts, the ground of our lives. We've got to go and till up that ground. The areas where we are hard and unforgiveness and um, where we're angry and um, where we're hurt and we won't let go of the hurt and we're bitter, you know, like um, like in, in, in the story with Ruth and Naomi. Naomi, um, her name meaning um, Mara, being bitter. She told them, you know, after her husband and her sons um, died, she said, when she went back home, she told them, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara because I'm bitter. So sometimes we have life deals with us a certain kind of way. And instead of us allowing God to deal with it, we try to deal with it on our own. And we don't allow God to come and be our help because he is a very present help in a time of trouble. We don't allow him to come and we don't allow and we don't break up that area because God is a gentleman. He told us to fall upon the stone. Break ourselves. So if we don't break up the follow ground, if we don't make that area, um, uh, put it in such a way where we can sow seeds of goodness, seeds of love, seeds of, of healing, you know, seeds of well-being back into ourselves so that we can feel better, so that we can grow into what God wants us to grow. Well, with the farmers, they break up the ground. And whatever, whether it's wheat or corn or whatever they're sowing out there, they start to scatter the seed. Because what they now want to do is they each one of those grains, they expect for it to go down into the ground that we've softened up, to go deep, not just lay on the surface. God wants us to go deep. He wants to go deep in us. Am I right? He wants to be rooted and grounded. And he wants us to be rooted and grounded in him. So when we do this with the seed, and the seed goes deep down, well, we know that when sometimes when we're throwing seed, just, just thinking in the farmer's mentality, that the seed doesn't always, even though we're throwing it in good ground because now we've softened it up, it doesn't always, every seed doesn't always fall in good ground. Sometimes there's some stones there, rocks there, you know, and thorns do come up. And the thorns come up to choke out the seed. Because it does not want the seed to go down, go deep, sprout up, and produce much fruit. And God wants us to produce much fruit for the glory of God. That will continue to hear me say, for the glory of God. Because God's going to give us everything that we need, but it's for his glory. It's not for us to show both or showcase, but it's for his glory. And so when they break, once we break up the ground, the farmers, they put the seed in, and the seed goes down, and we expect to see wheat, a lot of wheat. We expect to, expect to see ears of corn, and not just ears. We want stalks, big, tall stalks. Amen. You like corn on the cob? I like corn on the cob, too, and I like sweet corn on the cob, baby. Yes, I like bird's eye, sweet corn. Yes, I do. And so we want to see a lot of ears of corn come up, Evan. And so that's the same way when we sow seeds in the follow ground of our heart. We want to bring about a harvest of much love, much peace. You know, we want to have um, much, Pastor talks about patience. Pastor sowing seeds for patience. He wants much patience. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. And so we want to be able to produce much fruit. And so when we sow seeds into the follow grounds of our heart, when we break up our hearts, 
and we sow whatever seed it is or whatever the seed is. If we need um, finances, we gotta get a job. And we start to sow money into our bank accounts and in our savings account. Well, when we start to invest and divest, then what happens is we get an increase on that because we get what we call interest. And we want interest added to our lives. The same way spiritually, God wants to add interest to our spiritual lives. And so God wants us to bear not just fruit, but he wants us to bear much fruit for the kingdom. And then that's in John chapter, in John, um, in, in St. John, amen. He wants us to bear much fruit. And so either the reason people, you see that they don't bear the much fruit that God desires is either they're too hard, they're too proud, they're too stubborn, they're too willful, they got too much sin in their lives. They they're not they're uh, they're not they they don't they're not unashamed. They're not unapologetic. You know, so <clears throat> God wants us to soften up all of those rough edges in our lives. He wants us to smooth out those areas in our lives, those jagged areas of our lives, so that we can be able to bear much fruit. The rebelliousness. When we want to tell God no, when all he wants us to do is say yes. When we don't surrender, when God wants us to throw our hands up and we throwing our hands down. When God wants us to hold our heads up high, but we're holding our heads down. God says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and let the King of glory come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord our God, strong and mighty, mighty in battle. God, because guess what? The battle is not ours. It's the Lord's. It's not ours. It's the Lord's. And God has already given us the victory. Now, the fight is ours, but it's a fixed fight with a fixed principle. All we got to do is use the word of God. Because the fixed principle is the word of God. And so as long as we apply the word of God to break up the ground in our lives, that's not fallible. That's, that, that is fallible, excuse me. That is, that, and we need to be fallible because we are, um, God is infallible. He's the only one that's without any fault. But we have lots of faults. And we, we are being perfected. And every day we should be perfected by the word of God. Through the fivefold ministry, wherever it is, apostles, pastors, teachers, excuse me, pastors, apostles, preachers, teachers, um, prophets, um, evangelists. That's the fivefold ministry. Whoever God is allowing to speak. And anytime they speak, they've got to speak the word of God. And only speak the word of God. Because the word of God is what's going to help us to break ourselves. Amen. So, God will break up the ground of our lives so that we can produce much fruit in our lives. But we got to yield ourselves to him in order for it to be done. So, whether the storms in our lives, I'm telling you, he'll speak to the storm. He'll tell the storm, peace be still. Whatever the test of the trial is, whatever the deaths, whatever it is, he'll speak peace <coughs> to our soul. He'll bring comfort and joy to our spirit man. And he'll let us know that this too will not last forever. And this too shall pass. This is a temporary thing. So when we allow God to show us his word and show forth his word in our lives, and we can trust him enough to be God and Lord over our lives. Because remember um, a while ago, we talked about a few things. We talked about Jesus, Christ, and the Lord. And when we get saved, Jesus saves us. When we get sanctified, Christ is our sanctifier. And 
the Lord is sovereign. And when we decide that we will allow him to be Lord over every area of our lives, that's when we're going to realize that we have started to really experience what we refer to as true brokenness. To get saved, that's one thing. We let him come in. When we allow him to become Christ, he starts to sanctify us. In other words, he starts to water. He starts to put water in us and we start to grow. Because that's what it's about, maturing and growing up in him. And when we grow up in him, we start to cast aside those things that are not like him. And we start to give up those things. And we start to break ourselves. And then when he becomes Lord, that's when. We've broken it up. We've allowed him to go in. We've allowed him to go down deep. And now we're bringing about much fruit in our lives. And that's what he wants us to do. Jesus, we know he fed 5,000 with the loaves of bread. That's Mark chapter 6. Y'all just write these down because I'm getting ready to wind it up. Mark chapter 6, verse 32 through 44. 44, he fed 5,000 with broken loaves of bread. He blesses, the Bible lets us know he break it, and he had 12 baskets <coughs> left over. Mm. God wants to have leftovers in us. He wants us to be in the, live the abundant life. He wants us to live in the more than enough. He wants us to live in the overflow. And many of us are living in the overflow and we don't even realize it. We put ourselves somewhere, but God is saying we're living even in the overflow even now because if we're in him, we live in the overflow. If we're in him, we live in the overflow. If you're not living in the overflow, question whether or not you're living truly in him. So when God blesses, he breaks it, and it's always more than enough, and plenty is left over. Mary, in Mark chapter 14, verse 3 through 9, she broke the alabaster box, and we know she poured that precious ointment on the head of Jesus. And we know Judas got upset and said, why are you going to pour that precious oil? We could have got some money for that. But he said, she's done a great work upon me because she saw more than what they saw. They just saw on the surface. But the Lord knew that was her worship. She poured everything out on him. And God is calling for us to pour everything. When he asks us to break ourselves, he said, pour everything out on me. Don't leave nothing. Whatever it is that's going on, pour it all out on him. Pour it all out on him. Praise God. God always blesses. The word tells us the sacrifices of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Pastor, when we are on the first Sunday, we have communion. And I'm just going to go through these really quickly. Uh, we have the breaking of bread during the Lord's Supper. That's what we do when we do communion. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. And Pastor reads passages of scripture from Luke chapter 22, verse 19. He reads a passage of scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16.